Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're just after one o'clock, so uh, we'll um, kick off uh, this lunchtime's um, Arctic webinar on data management for post-COVID service restoration. Um, if you can, please keep your microphone muted unless you're um, invited to, uh, to talk or a presenter. Um, we are recording this session um, and it will be uh, available on the Arctic uh, YouTube channel uh, tomorrow. Um, and if you've got any questions, then please feel free to put them in the chat function and we'll um, do our best to, uh, to answer them for you. Um, I'm Tim Rivett. I'm the uh, general manager of Arctic and I'm your host for today. Um, this afternoon we have um, got um, a double act from West Yorkshire Combined Authority. Lisa and Graham are going to talk to us about um, what they're doing at the moment and some of their plans for the future. Uh, we've got Sonia from Essex County Council and then uh, Julie Williams from Traveline is going to uh, show us uh, some of her uh, new developments. And then um, I'm going to bring together um, a number of conversations that I've had with operators and suppliers and, and authorities um, to just uh, try and bring uh, a bit of a, a wider perspective um, to things. And then um, we'll finish off with questions. And uh, we aim to finish by two o'clock. Um, so I know that some of you um, on the call um, are new to Arctic, so um, apologies for those that know all about us. Um, we're a trade industry body for public transport technology stakeholders. Uh, we've got a membership of uh, the whole range of players in the uh, in the sector, from uh, from authorities to consultants, um, with uh, suppliers and operators. Um, and we do things like this, help try and educate people We're on transport technology matters. We develop and promote standards, um, both within the UK, uh, European and, and wider. Um, and so that's um, enough about Artig. Um, today, um, we're going to pick up on some of the challenges that... Um, people have been having uh, as a result of um, the COVID shutdown and starting to restore services. Um, I don't think this is going to go anywhere um, soon. Um, it is something that we're going to have to get used to. Um, back in um, April, Traffic Commissioner kindly introduced some changes for COVID shutdown for registrations, reflecting the need for for reduced travel um, and needing to, uh, to to reduce the number of journeys and services um, that operators were running. Um, earlier this week, they announced that uh, the current temporary variations will be allowed to uh, the end of September in England and the end of August in other countries um, in the UK. Um, Beyond that, though, I can still see um, far more change happening than uh, than we've been used to over the last uh, few years, uh, and a lot of that will be uh, probably at shorter notice than we're historically used to, uh, and that undoubtedly gives some people um, some significant challenges um, when they're trying to uh, provide information to the customer. Uh, and that's where we will uh, pick up um, with um, the first of our um, guests today, um, Lisa Giraldi from um, West Yorkshire um, Combined Authority. Um, and I will just uh, hand over to her. Welcome, Lisa. Hi, Tim. Right, I'll just do this. Yep. 
Has the screen come up yet? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so my name's Lisa Geraldi. I work for the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. And as Tim mentioned, um, he asked us to speak about the service resumption challenges we face. Um, challenges of keeping data updated and the data we need to help provide information as services are restored. I thought I'd ask um, a few of the departments what's been affected by this and get their take on it. Um, I think one thing we can all agree on is having enough time to actually get the changes in and done. Um, but I'll start with our bus services team. Um, I tried to give a little bit of a background to what they do as well. Um, just for a bit of understanding. So, so basically, they, they, they're the ones discussing the changes with operators, dealing with tendered services and dealing with the registrations. Um, the issues they've changed, sorry, face are like registrations and short term changes being sent in different formats and in different ways. For example, still getting them by post when we're not in the building, um, like on email summaries and ex, um, like spreadsheets. Um, they said that the Traffic Commissioner's Office um, hadn't been very clear on how the operator should make short-term changes. I don't know if that's the same for everybody or not. Um, so they said that um, what had helped them would be a preferred way of uh, the preferred way of sending short-term changes would be via email. Um, they'd like some advice regarding do they have to send the local authority notification form or letter um, before they submit the changes. Apparently they don't know this. And they have been sending letters where possible. Um, they mentioned some sort of approval system would be beneficial to them. Um, so the next team affected by this is our data team. Um, so they're basically inputting information from the um, bus service registrations into our internal system and then this goes on to feed like journey planners, roadside displays, real time for the smaller operators. Um, again, it's the amount of data they've had to input in such a short period of time. So we found that like the journey plan has been out of date quite a bit because they're always a couple of weeks behind because it's just the sheer volume of stuff changing. Um, sometimes the timetables are coming on like an Excel spreadsheet with about 20 tabs and it makes it hard to decipher the information to put it into, into the system because it's still manually inputting this. Um, some of the information not being correct such as stock usage, timing point, routes, and then time lost due to emailing queries and the waiting responses. But what they did say is that the operators have been brilliant in getting back to them fast with the correct information, what they need. Um, I think it's safe to say we've all been up against it, really, haven't we? They said what I'd help them would be timetable sent in PDF format. They said operators prioritising which of the services or areas they'd like them to input first, um, just to give a bit of guidance. Um, and especially where there's a full network change. Um, and operators check in that what they send, um, it's like correct information is there. Um, so the travel systems team, which is the team I work for, um, we validate operator and authority data to ensure that um, it can be accepted into the system and that the information is correct. Building deploy database and monitor on street displays as such. So we've had quite a, a few challenges with operators. Um, again, just chasing them, getting it in an incorrect format or the standards with usual standards are not met. Like, I don't know, like destinations and stuff, just truncated commas in them you know just don't make sense split destinations not there and um, sometimes the changes of that last minute if you can't get them into the system um, and time loss again query and errors um, and then when i'm building the data i've got such, i've got such um 
you know, we're doing it like on a weekly basis, and it's quite trial. Um, there's extra manual edits to fix the data content, and we also I do try and manipulate data where I can. So, for instance, if an operator hasn't been able to send all the timetables which will go into a Sunday service, for instance, from Monday to Sunday, I could edit that. I could delete out the Monday to Friday and Saturday and make the Sunday run all the way through the week. Um, that one also at the beginning um, when it first happened. Um, so what would help us would be more time operators just checking the data themselves before sending it to us. Um, our mother passing for team, because they're basically just keeping the public updated on, on what information is currently showing incorrect in our systems. So, and the disruption messaging and the putting on like interim information online as time as like PDF timetables until we can get our other systems updated. Um, so they've had problems due to the volume of timetables getting them online again in time, keeping up with services that need real time messages because they're incorrect or the changes are late. So we try to give the public as much information as what we can you know, out on displays, um, keeping up um, with timetables that have, have had like um, they've put online and then they've come back, there's been errors in there. Um, so we've had to redo them and put them back online. And again, they've struggled with the formats that have been sent. Again, for in, they have to they prefer it in PDF, but they're getting it, if they're getting it in Excel, they've got to reformat that into PDF and so on. I get to what I'd help is PDF and correct information submitted first time. And then I thought I'd include bus station managers because they're out there in the bus stations. And they said they just want to keep the customer happy and informed. And that means keeping the toilets open and available, real time information correct, timetables are up to date, and the travel centres are open. Now they've had problems with the service changing so rapidly and so often of keeping up with that information to give the customer the right information and they've not had the paper information the, the real time's been correct for some days so it's just trying to get that the correct stuff over to customer um and the closed travel centers caused them an issue um said a big thing that would help would be inspectors um from the bus operators on site to assist in the increase um in, of inquiries uh, just when it first happens, um, up-to-date information showing on real-time displays and then the opening of the travel centres, which I believe we have mostly all open now. Um, yeah, so really that, that's me. And this was more about the larger operators because I know it's hard for the smaller operators to get stuff to us in PDF and, and, and stuff like that. So that's me done. Mm. Thank you, Lisa. That was a fascinating uh, view of the, the scale of the problem and the number of different people um, mm. that is uh, affected. Um, we're now going to um, go to uh, to Graham Davis from uh, from West Yorkshire, who's going to um, update us on uh, real time and some of their plans. Sorry, the camera. Um, no, I'd like to say that. Um, Lisa and her team are, have been working non-stop virtually weekends to get this going because at the start, um, like everybody, nobody knew what was going to happen with this. Um, and structurally, the size of the system, because we're not just covering West Yorkshire here, we're covering South Yorkshire, North Yorkshire, East Yorkshire, Hull, as well as York City when we're producing this data stream. And you're dealing with all these parties for their, their standard data along with all the operators in these areas and getting this information out of them has been quite painful to start with, but I think we're in sort of a, a basis now that things are quite happening quite regularly. The um, the system has always been a two weekly update, but now we're looking at probably a week, sometimes twice a week to deal with the, the, the ongoing changes that we've got. But when we look at the impact that COVID's had on us, um, we're, in the, we're in the design phase now for a procurement of a new real-time system. And this was never, 
never entered in anybody's head about actually um, passengers actually knowing how busy a bus is, a train's there, a train tells you if it's busy, generally if seats booking. And we're now undertaking a, a development with the existing suppliers that we've got to get this level of passenger counting out onto the street, uh, out onto the LED displays, because we've got an estate now of displaced over over 2,000 plus displays, and this is growing. So we're looking probably in about three, two to three years, nearly 3,000 displays out in, in the Yorkshire region. And they're our primary point for people actually seeing information, so messaging, you know, web apps are fantastic, but a web app on, you know, 20, 30 people stood at a bus stop, one person might have it, but a sign in front of people's faces is, is, is there, it's, it's, they can't ignore it. So these things are now being looked at, how are we going to go forward? And another thing with the elements is that actually we, we've always thought the system we had is always quite rigorous and really slow at ch changing over data. And we have, with the team, managed to get it done quickly. But even though we go for a an automatic system which we're going to look at in the future of doing things really easily and quickly, there is still a blocking point that the operator is getting the, the data on time and then the accurate data on time. Because the last thing we want to do is, like Lisa said, people are relying on the real-time information now because it's part of the psyche here. You now it's been out for a long, long time as being relevant because... We still have paper timetables. Paper timetables take days, weeks, months to change. The real time changes instantly. And this is the point of contact that we need to get to people quickly. Uh, and this is the way we want to go forward and, and bring the stuff into the into, into the public all the time. And like they say, the passenger counting was looked at as possible future, but I think as going forward, it will be standard on what we want to do as, a, as a, an offering to the public. Right. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Graham, for that. Uh, useful uh, to uh, to understand where you're going um, in future. Uh, thank you to both of you from uh, from West Yorkshire, a large metropolitan authority. Um, we're now going to go to uh, the other uh, end of the uh, country, nearly to to Sonia, to a uh, to a county council to um, find out um, the challenges that she's been facing. Hi, hopefully you can uh, see me and hear me. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. That's good. Hello from Essex. Um, I think um, a lot of what I'm going to uh, be saying is um, going to be echoing um, some of what Lisa said. Um, sorry, my uh, PowerPoint's decided to play up. Um, okay, so a bit of background uh, about Essex. Um, we're down in the uh, southeast um, of the country. Um, we're a, a two-tier authority um, with uh, 12 districts and boroughs uh, below us. We also have two unitary author authorities, um, Southend and Farrock. Um, they're our partners um, in our real-time system. So our real-time system covers um, our whole county um, and it's our real-time system and the real-time uh, effect COVID, COVID has had on real-time that I'm going to talk about today. Um, we have um, some considerable borders. Um, the, uh, we uh, border a number of London boroughs, uh, Hertfordshire, Cambridgeshire, um, Suffolk, um, and also uh, we have a, a divided by water border with Kent as well. So uh, a little bit more on um, our background. Um, we these these figures are for um, Essex alone, not our um, unitary colleagues. Um, we have uh, uh, just over 500 bus services um, in our uh, data system um, service uh, data management service system. Um, they are provided by 40 uh, bus operators. They are a combination of commercial services and also of um, uh, contracted services that, that we pay for. Um, we have over 7,500 bus stops and uh, just over 450 uh, real-time displays throughout um, Essex. 
Now, pre-COVID, pre um, we were making approximately 400 bus service changes um, a year. We didn't impose any um, set times for those changes on operators. Um, that sort of averages out roughly about seven per week, and, and we were literally making those changes when they um, came in. To show the difference, um, what we've had um, in the last couple of weeks, uh, the last week of May, we had 25 changes made by three operators and uh, one operator made 48 changes in the first week of June. Um, as uh, Lisa said, um, now that the, um, the obligatory uh, periods of uh, notice um, have been uh, lapsed while co uh, the COVID issues is going ahead, these have all been short notice changes. Okay, just a, a brief sort of summary of um, how our real-time um, system works. Um, we receive service registrations in from uh, our operators. They go into our data management system. Um, that data management system, we then build our own uh, data file, which is uploaded to our JMW real-time system. The running board information is then added to that um, so that we have a complete um, data set for the scheduled information. We then also receive um, a, a Siri feed from uh, a number of operators. This gives the live locational bus information. And when you add those two together, hopefully you come out with real time. However, if for anything, if for any reason that information does not add up, um, say the running board information is different or um, something's missing from the Siri feed, that information will turn into uh, scheduled time rather than real time. Prior to COVID, we were actually showing both real time and scheduled time. And the reason was because out of those 40 plus operators that we have, only five are actually equipped to give us real time. So we always included the scheduled time of those operators that weren't capable of giving us real time. So when COVID struck, um, we had to make a decision quite quickly. Um, I heard um, yesterday um, a presenter say that um, from their experience that uh, bus services had actually crashed to 7% of what their original pre-COVID total, uh, total was um, when uh, we were told initially about lockdown. Um, that, that's a huge amount of um, information uh, to come out of the system. So we actually made a, a decision to uh, remove our real time, remove the scheduled time and just put a message up. The message was um, threefold in that it was giving information about operators' websites, um, but it was also sort of giving the um, government information um, about uh, not travelling, if, if, um, you know, during lockdown um, and uh, ensuring sort of uh, public safety. So we used it for, for those purposes. The one of the issues we had was um, the the seventy day day's notice period was removed um, for service changes and the operators understandably took that on board and when the lockdown began lifting um, they started making changes at very short notice. Now because of the size of our data we had quite a large um, task of keeping on top of that data and that's still ongoing. Uh, the service changes are coming in sometimes um, with only a couple of days notice um, to begin and it's not possible for us to um, keep that data um, up to date within our data management system and then feed it to our real-time system. Now the way we, our colleagues in um, South End, our partners, uh, wanted to uh, carry on giving real time. And because they are a, a smaller um, authority with less services, they were able to um, change their data manually. Um, and we understand and, and applaud that. Um, we, we still had concerns about them keeping their data up to date because even the operators were struggling to do that at that time. We have still kept this uh, messaging on our, our screens for the time being. 
we are now looking at what our options are going forward and we're constantly having discussions about this internally um, we view that we've we've got three options going forward only showing the messaging that's what we're doing at the moment the issues with that is that it's not really helpful we're pointing people to um, websites to operators um, but if you don't have the access the internet access especially when you're standing at a bus stop that can be the most annoying information ever um, however we know that it is actual truthful information it's where they're going to get accurate information from we could show real time only um, that will be accurate because as i explained before if, if um the two the requirements the scheduled information doesn't match up with the the series feed the real time will disappear however it doesn't explain to the public why their bus isn't on that system um, and often uh gives more uh, questions um, than it does actually answer um, the other option is to show all information including the scheduled information and the real time uh, the the big disadvantages of this is that um, we know that some of our information could be wrong um, with 40 plus operators it, all it takes is to miss one service or be um, late getting that um, information into the data and then it, it won't show correctly so our solution for restarting at the moment we can't do anything we still feel we're in the position where we don't have enough control over our data um, to be able to put real time back up so we are showing information we have two displays in our town center where we are showing real time um, and we are monitoring um, how much real time is actually being shown at any given time um, and how many services are actually not being shown um, we think this is the only correct information um, and the only way that we can sort of um, give our customers reassurance um, that they will find correct information and that's by going to the operators directly we understand that there's, there's issues with this um, and I don't feel we've got any choice at the moment but as I say we are reviewing it almost on a daily basis and that's all I have to say that that's me done Thank you, Sonia. That's uh, that's a very interesting um, view from uh, from from Essex and the challenge that you've you've got, um, which I think um, I'll uh, I'll pick up later. But uh, it's it's not unusual position to be in. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've had Wicker and we've had Essex who. Uh, our authorities um next we will move to uh julie williams from uh, from travel line who has a uh, slightly different set of challenges um as a uh, effectively a data aggregator at a national scale um so okay. julie are you there yeah yes. thanks yeah thanks tim i hope you can all see me i have got a couple of screen shares but not Oh, I've been made the presenter. Okay, I'll do the screen share now then, in that case. Okay, so yeah, I mean, listening to what you've said so far, what the presenters have said so far, I can completely understand where you're coming from. And we're dealing with, um, I was just going to do a live time as check up on leads now. Um, <laughs> we're dealing with um, the data that comes into our journey planner is from um, all of you as local authorities. We don't have any direct data from operators. So that we, we know that the data that's coming into our national journey planner might not be correct. Um, and there's nothing that we can do about that. We have no control over what you do or want to. We don't know when they're real time because we've got three tabs on our journey plan. You've got your plan your journey here. Um, and during that point, we're using the TNDS for that. We've got live times here. And for that, we're using 52 real time feeds from around the country. So if that's not working, then that's not right. Um, and then of course, we've got the timetable lookup and that again is generated from the TNDS. So if any of your data is not right, which it hasn't been, it's never gonna, you're never gonna be able to keep up with that volume of demand, then our journey planner is wrong as well. So we had to think about um, one of the ways we could mitigate for this really quickly. Um, and we have a call center as many of you do. Um, ours is based in, in um, Exeter. 
and they are open from seven in the morning till um, ten o'clock at night, seven days a week, and they're taking calls. And some days we had more phone calls than journey plan requests, which has never happened. Uh, and sit well, not since we had a website, not for the last twenty years. So people were ringing up because they couldn't find out the right source of the information. So the agents were spending quite a lot of time um, trawling through operator websites, trying to find the right update to the timetable, or looking at local authorities. So to do that, they built themselves a database um, that allowed them to find quick links to operators. And we had to think about that and thought, why can't we have that open to operators to use in the short term so that we can give them the option of adding services to, um, to the website? We've, we've also looked at the option of getting data direct from operators, and we can technically do that already for first group. We're ready to go with that when first group is ready and when our local authority partners are ready but in reality nobody can do a, shoot, a quick shutdown overnight certainly first group's data wasn't ready um, even for their own website um, and it would be the same with the other groups so um, whereas i do understand the challenge of you having very late notice data actually you know the 52 schedulers in first group or the 52 depots trying to make their trans exchange change four times a week in the first weeks is equally challenging and some of the medium sized operators put their drivers into furlough 85 percent of them in the first three weeks so there were no drivers there were no technical people and very few schedulers so i think as an industry we've all had this challenge and it's really this is about how we deal with it the next time around because you know we can't pretend this is never going to happen again not plan for it so what we've done in the short term, it was a, four, a very quick four week project. In fact, our call center manager um, exposed his um, database to me so that I could see how it worked. He made me a user. I'll just give you a quick screenshot of this. Um, I can't go back a page further where we start from because my password is on the screen. I can't take it off. So essentially what you've got here for every single operator in the country, you're able to add it, and this is a live database, so I won't do any changes. Um, you can see that Stuart Groom at Arriva added this in, in May. So um, you're able to put in a, a message against your timetables, um, and you're allowed to set a date on it, and you can put a link to the correct timetable. Um, and in reality, I don't know if any of you have tried linking to other people's timetables, they change, the links don't persist. So generally that, that link is into the root of their search for that company rather than to the individual timetable. Um, and we've also added a COVID-19 messaging that helps to reassure customers about how, how to travel on buses safely, even though they weren't supposed to be doing it. So I'll show you what it looks like in a minute. So the, the approach that operators, and we, we approach this through the big five, um, through the Operator Digital Initiative, which is um, and through album. We've had we had a mixed um, response in that they all thought it was a great idea. Some but it, some of them had people to do the work and some didn't. So go ahead and Ariva have edited their own messages. And first group and stagecoach and National Express bus were added and edited by the call centre and checked by the operator. So you can simply just put in a message across the top here and you can apply it to all the services. I mean, it, it's not about where your town is busy, which stops are busy, and it's not intended to replace a disruptions messaging system. But it was free um, and we helped to design it at the call centre and it helped us all out so it didn't cost us anything apart from you know a, a couple of late nights and a couple of weekends of work which I think is what we all do in these situations you know you just step on you try and you try and find fixes so this um, this piece of software is available to some of the operators and the call centre I'll talk a bit in a minute about how we can change that in the future it gets exported every hour from from the call centre in a tab separated comma version that goes to our web providers uh, Macway and it takes about a couple of hours to go live on our website so just to give you an indication of how that looks this is a, a timetable search in the Brighton area I just happen to know that there's some, some data there so these the things that are new are this section here which is your warning to say you can expand that I don't know if you can read that. It just it's just the it's just the um Arriva, the go ahead message to say that the buses will be busier and it links through importantly to their up to date timetable. So whether or not we know that each local authority is up to date, because we don't expect them to tell us um whether they're up to date because it's just such a big piece of work even telling us that without having to micromanage it. We broadly expect that there might be some timetable changes and these messages are due to come off at the end of June. So you can um you could link through there to the that takes you straight to the operator page. So immediately you've got the um, the Brighton Herbie Run that site. You can look at all their COVID data as well. Um, we've the Twitter feed has been there for a while, but it's actually become much more useful now. If you look at their Twitter, they're telling you about suspensions, but every other message is also about wearing face masks. 
um, and the way that you know keeping the two meter distance wearing face marks disruption so that message in itself is quite useful because that is direct from the operator and you have the customer at one point here being informed about everything this is um the COVID information so again we keep them on the same stream we drop that down um, for the full message and then you can go through to the operator's COVID-19 page um, for the updates on timetables if they have a separate COVID page it goes to that so that has been live for about four weeks I think we went live um, at the end of May with this is it the end of May yes I think so it's gone so quickly um, and I think the point is that whereas we can't manage we can't manage the data feed we can manage how we present that to the customer and because what the challenge that we're doing is this is a national level we have to have a fairly simple approach for it and it's a pretty homemade database you can see um, and the biggest part of the work has been the changes to the website which i've provided within um, 10 days of being placed with the order so it's all been rushed through quite quickly um, but what remains is a system that we could um, use our call centre agents to complete for local authorities if that was required. And when we come out of this, um, the next two weeks of complete rush on what we're doing for bus open data and, and delivering this, we'll think about how local authority partners can input to this without having to do anything else. I mean, even if it's just sending our call centre agents an email to say things that need to be marked up or things that aren't up to date. Um, I think really thinking about everybody having access to edit a live database is not a good policy particularly as we only have one password at the moment. So um, we're making the most of our call centre agents who we paid anyway to be there for the whole shift. When there are no calls coming in, this is what they do. Um, so seven in the morning till eight at night, um, 10 at night, we've got that team of people there to do this information. Um, the other thing that's worth noting is that um, this is exportable as a tab separated file. Um, and I don't think we would have a problem with this being open if anybody else would find it useful to put into their systems. Um, we, we've kind of mentioned this to the DFT for BODs and at the moment there isn't anywhere for it to go um, and we might just publish it alongside the TNDS but I think it, it would be useful feedback to have from this group is if this is something you would find useful um, then we I don't think we would have a problem sharing it at all it's not a difficult thing to share it's just a flat file probably not every hour but uh, we could definitely put it on an FTP site it would be easy for you to take it down um, it's just worth noting as well that if there is no service data here or if there is no COVID information, you don't get those buttons. So you'll never get no answer. You'll, you won't see the warnings if they're not there. Um, you'll see on some of the, go back to the COVID-19 messaging. You scroll down the page, you can't scroll because the go to meeting buttons up. You can scroll down, you can see there are no messages on some and some of the messages are different for some operators than others. Um, so really that's, that's how we've tried to manage it um, at a national level where we don't have or expect to have any control over data supply but we do have quite a big number of customers who are still using our website we're back up to about 50 percent capacity of inquiries that we were this time last year so people are coming back to the bus and they are coming back to our information services okay that's me mm. thank you julie uh, it's reassuring that people are re beginning to to come back and and look yeah. for for data and uh, and what you've what you've achieved in a very short space of time um is uh is very impressive um yeah if 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 people feel that that data source uh, would be useful then um you probably already know julie's details if not get in contact with me and i'll um put you in contact or put a message in the uh in the chat yeah. function yeah, or if anybody wants to would find this useful to add to, to give us information about it, even if it's just an email, then um, of course we'd be look, willing to look at doing that as well. It's, it's free, by the way. There's no charge for any of this, so you don't worry about money. <laughs> you might get more takers suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So thank you, Julie. Um, okay. I will now um, do a uh, a quick sort of summary of uh, some of the conversations that I've had um, preparing for this um, and um, in the preceding uh, weeks. Um, so um, operators, um, as you've already heard, um, they're making a lot of decisions, um, often very, very close to change dates. Um, a number of operators have said that they've been um, rescheduling vehicles and, and drivers on the Friday for a Monday morning start 
Um, and so therefore data is only being um, d sort of input into scheduling systems um, on a Sunday and made available on a Sunday. So uh, it's really not a surprise that there's people are struggling to uh, to get information out. Um, a lot of the operators have said that they're working more smartly than they did before um, as a team rather than doing things um, on an ad hoc basis, actually planning what's happening in a week and being much more structured um, and working on regular, normally weekly cycles for uh, looking at what vehicles are allocated to routes and, and driver um, allocations for, for brakes, um, which are harder to manage now as People need to to manage the number of people in canteens and depots more tightly than uh, than before social distancing. Um, quite a number have said that they're in the process or they have streamlined data distribution. So rather than when they've made a change, um, emailing out um, the update to lots of different places, to different system suppliers and authorities, they're just putting it in the one place and saying, come and get it. Uh, Reading buses um, were uh, have moved so that rather than sending it out to over a dozen people every time the data changes, they just put it onto uh, Passengers Open Data Platform and point people at it and say, go and get the update. Um, so some of these, um, changes I think will will stay um, and um, whilst it's been a bit crazy for the last um, couple of months um, I, I think some of them will be beneficial in the long run in terms of efficiency and effectiveness. Um, a number of changes had to be made to journey times because there were very few cars moving around um, and so um, buses weren't getting um, snarled up so uh, a lot shorter journey times in some cases. Now they're seeing that journey times are increasing. Um, it's taking 30 or 50% more time for people to board a bus than it did with the need to social distance and find your seat um, and not move until the bus has stopped. Um, and, uh, and there's a few that are concerned that as vehicle numbers increase you'll get congestion but you'll still have the increased boarding times and so um, in four or five months time they're expecting um, longer journey times for uh, existing routes. Um, overall um, across operators and authorities a lot of people are saying actually um, one of the benefits that's come out has been that they understand the software better rather than doing things um, every now and then, even if that was fairly regularly, they've had to use their tools a lot more regularly and a lot more intensively, so they actually know how to use them better. Um, and so they're using them more quickly and efficiently as well. Um, and that's been helped by a number of enhancements that have been rolled out by um, suppliers, some of them brand new functionality, for crowdedness from ticketer and passenger. If you want to know more about that, um, see some of our previous webinars. Um, but people like OmniTimes, a little change um, was made and suddenly you can override start and end dates in an export rather than having to uh, go into each day type and, uh, and edit them there. And that's saving an awful lot of time, people are saying. So that some of those little tweaks can make a real big difference. Um, on street, um, it's fun and games. Um, lots of people saying um, on street parking is a real problem um, because people weren't traveling to work. Um, actually, for the first time ever, all of the cars on the street are parked. And if you've got a bus trying to get down there, then there's a lot of streets that have been impassable. And uh, one operator that I was talking to said that about 30% of their routes have had to have um, routes changes because they've got roads that they would normally get down but are now clogged with cars. Um, and um, 
fairly ubiquitously there's there's a lot of frustration at the moment about rapid changes to streets as lanes get reduced to enable walking and cycling to happen at a more distanced level um but one of the big things is that um communications uh, is varied between authorities and the approaches being taken by different authorities uh, is causing problems because they don't know um which one to to follow um and some of the inconsistencies are causing uh, challenges particularly um on ticketing i know this is more about information but some of the encts uh, differences are particularly troublesome at the moment. Um, information services, by and large, as we've heard um, from from Julie, um, a lot of textual messages giving people um, you know, more generalised advice and, and where to go for for more information. Um, there's a lot of ticker tape warnings um, with data that is still uh, out of date um, underneath it um, and so uh, caution needs to be uh, made um, as Julie said um, an increased social media Twitter um, seems to be uh, the go-to uh, source for a lot of up-to-date information um, and um, if you've got timetables at bus stops then um, as we heard earlier uh, that's a real problem a lot of the time people have just taken them down or just papered over them um, because there's no chance of keeping them up to date. Um, generally um, the feedback and the feeling I've, I've got from people um, is that if you've got a direct source from an operator then um, actually information services are generally coping and reasonably up to date. Um, if you're in um travel lines position or or you're acting as an aggregator then you're struggling to to keep uh getting the data through and, and keeping on top of it um which uh, I, I think that's something that you know we can uh that we can focus on as things start to become a bit more um normal and try and work out how we can make sure that everybody's getting the data that they need uh, in a timely manner. Um, so that was a quick sort of summary of uh, of the conversations that um, I've had um, with people um, running up to this. Um, and now we're open for questions. Um, everybody's been very silent in the chat so far. Um, so um, if you want to um, put any questions in the chat, um, then um, please do so. Um, while we're waiting for people to do that, um, we are um, carrying on with uh, webinars um, over the next few months over the summer. Um, bearing in mind people probably aren't going to be traveling abroad and things like that in the same way over the summer so we'll be continuing those um, uh, if you want to find out about passenger counting and and how to present that to um, passengers then we've got a couple of um, previous webinars up on uh, our youtube channel um, we are planning more, as I've said. Um, one of the ones um, that I would like to have been able to give a date for um, for you now um, is uh, about seat booking um, on buses. There's a lot of conversations happening at the moment. There's four or five trials that I'm aware of, um, and I'm just in the process of uh, trying to gather enough people together that are happy to talk. Um, to be able to uh, provide you with a webinar on it. Um, and we're also planning sessions on data standards, such as Trans Exchange and Siri, as we head through the summer into the autumn and um, BODS starts to um, become more of a uh, pressing matter for people. 
and the need to supply the department with uh, data. And if you have any ideas for sessions, anything you want to find out more about, then please get in contact um, with um, me. My details are there. Um, get in contact if you want to find out more about Artig um, and what we do um, and how we can uh, work together and how you can join. Um, and we still have no questions. So brilliant presentations um, that answered everybody's questions in advance. That's always good. Um, I'd like to wrap up by saying thank you to Lisa and Graham from uh, West Yorkshire, um, Sonia from Essex and Julie from Traveline for their uh, very helpful uh, and insightful presentations. And I hope you found today's session useful and hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching this Artig webinar. To find out more about Artig and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you.